So with the third wave hitting the UK, passenger numbers are still well below 40% for pre-March levels. There's a little chance of things going back to normal anytime soon. Now can someone please let me out of here? show about the railway with new episodes once a month, every month. With the COVID-19 pandemic now well behind us, it's time to start talking about how to build back better, making sure the railway is at the centre of a tr sustainable transport policy. But now let's return to reality. As we all suspected, rail franchising is well and truly dead. I'll tell you what's wrong with it, my lad. It's dead. That's what's wrong with it. Most operators' emergency measures agreements expired in September and have been replaced with emergency recovery measures agreements, which are basically the same thing. With passenger numbers well below anywhere close to breaking even, companies are currently unable to actually make any money, so the government is taking on all revenue risk in a model similar to the London Overground or Thameslink. And this is how the railway is going to be run for the foreseeable future, bar full renationalisation, which is what has actually happened in Wales. The Welsh Government will take over the operation of the Wales and Borders franchise from Coyotes Army in February. And there is some speculation that the Scottish Government is considering doing the same with ScotRail. Over the summer, operators cautiously welcomed passengers back on board after non-essential use of public transport was formally allowed on the 17th of July. Face masks have been mandatory on all modes of public transport since the 15th of June. These rules are pretty much the same across the entire world. Recent studies have shown that public transport, including rail, is actually a lot safer than was previously thought. Partly thanks to mask wearing and intensive cleaning of surfaces, the chances of actually catching COVID-19 on board public transport is ridiculously small. As a result, some have criticised the rail industry for not doing enough to advertise this and get passengers to get back on board. It's not particularly surprising this hasn't happened since the companies no longer carry revenue risk and so it doesn't make much difference to them how many passengers they carry and the government hasn't been particularly keen on getting passengers back on public transport en masse either. There was no equivalent to eat out to help out for public transport. This hasn't been the case everywhere. Belgium, for instance, offered free train tickets to encourage people back onto the railway. With the second wave beginning to hit the UK, non-essential use of public transport is once again being restricted in parts of the country. And with many people continuing to work from home, passenger numbers are once again dropping, though not as dramatically as during the first wave. TfL had to receive another £1.7 billion bailout over the autumn. Like rail operators, local transport operators have struggled to fund their services with passenger fare box revenue weighed down. Now, as we all know, public transport is a public good, and the effects of COVID-19 can hardly be pinned on the transport operators themselves, but as we know, the Conservatives have a certain motivation to present this as a failing of TfL, in particular the Labour London Mayor Sadiq Khan, but at least Sadiq Khan knows that Watford isn't in Greater London. As the UK returned to lockdown in November, open access operators Grand Central and Hull Trains once again suspended their services, resuming at the beginning of December. Sadly, Grand Central have also announced that its long-term plans to start new services between London Euston and Blackpool North have been permanently abandoned. At the time of filming, the situation in the UK is once again going to shit, with London and the South East being put into Tier 4 non-essential travel in or out has been banned, so further service reductions are likely. The announcement of Tier 4 from midnight prompted a wave of passengers using the train to escape London at the last minute, leading to scenes like this at major stations. Eurostar services were once again cut back in August after the UK imposed quarantine restrictions on France, Belgium and the Netherlands. The company has announced some long-term cuts to its services, including the south of France services and all calls at Ebbsfleet and Ashford until at least 2022. Despite the restrictions, the long-awaited direct Amsterdam to London service did finally launch on the 26th of October. Not that anybody noticed, because we all went back into lockdown just a few days later. The situation has gotten even worse since then. On the 20th of December, France, Belgium and the Netherlands all closed their borders to the UK entirely because of the new Covid strain, meaning Eurostar is now entirely suspended, something that didn't even happen at the peak of the first wave in April. Quick update to this, Eurostar services resumed on the 31st of December, but France, Belgium and Netherlands are all applying very strict entry requirements. The road, or rather the track, to recovery is going to be a long one. Once case numbers are down, it will be imperative to get passengers back onto the railway to prevent gridlock on our roads. 
which means it's more important than ever not to raise rail fares. Yet it has been announced that rail fares will rise by 2.6%, way above inflation, in March. What an utterly ridiculous decision. No vision, no strategy, completely shooting ourselves in the foot, just a short-termist urge to claw back as much revenue as possible and sod the consequences for the long-term railway market, let alone the environment. But hey, that's the Conservatives for you. A ScotRail HST hit a landslip in Stonehaven, Scotland on the 12th of August, causing it to derail. Three people, including the driver and the conductor, were tragically killed in the accident. It was the first fatal accident on the UK rail network since Grey Rig in 2007. And now, the news we've all been waiting for. The Pacer trains are finally, finally gone. At least on Northern. The last train ran on Northern on the 27th of November. I remember this time last year I actually predicted the last train wouldn't be gone until December, so I was almost right. But there are still a few units knocking about on the Great Western and the Welsh networks, although I believe they are all set to be withdrawn by the end of this year when the current extension to the accessibility deadline is up. Quick update to this, the last Pacers have now been withdrawn from Great Western Railway. However, 15 Class 143 Pacers have been given dispensation to continue running in Wales until at least May 2021. The saga never really ends, does it? Orion Rail have converted a former Class 319 to become a new parcel-carrying freight multiple unit. The company is also proposing to convert two bi-mode Class 769s to freight multiple units, and they've proposed a new service between London and Liverpool. A row broke out in Greater Manchester over Northern's plans to temporarily withdraw services to the Rosehill Marple branch line, which would have cut all services to Hyde North, Hyde Central, Woodley and Rosehill Marple stations. The plans were opposed by local Conservative MP William Ragg, as well as local Labour and Liberal Democrat councillors, including Lisa Smart. Northern eventually U-turned on the decision. Stevenage has finally gained a fifth platform, allowing the return of the Hartford Loop service. The northern end of the Hartford Loop has been replaced by rail replacement buses for the last two years. Alstom is set to acquire the train manufacturing arm of Bombardier after the EU agreed the merger. A report by the National Infrastructure Commission has cast doubts on the planned eastern leg of HS2, running from Birmingham through East Midlands hub to Leeds and also serving Sheffield. The report suggests that the line should initially terminate at East Midlands Parkway and that upgrades to the existing line will be sufficient in the short term. Except anybody who understands HS2 will know that this is nonsense. Without the eastern leg, the existing line between the East Midlands and Leeds, which is already excruciatingly slow, will continue to be clogged up by intercity trains. The people who complain about HS2 point out that it's imp only improving journey times on routes where the journey times are already pretty acceptable, like London to Birmingham and London to Manchester. But it's on the eastern leg where the real transformative journey time changes are achieved, not just to or from London. But between Birmingham and Leeds, down from 1 hour 58 to 49 minutes, Birmingham to Nottingham, down from 1 hour 12 to 33 minutes, and Leicester to Leeds, down from 2 hours to 46 minutes. Scrapping the eastern leg would be yet another middle finger from Westminster to the north especially Leeds, which has probably received the least out of any city when it comes to public transport funding. At least Manchester, Sheffield and Nottingham got shiny new trams, Leeds got absolutely nothing. Scrapping East Midlands hub whilst the station concept is imperfect would be a disaster for the region this late in the planning, as the region has already planned its entire transport and housing strategy around the station. Let's move over to Germany, which has ambitious plans to expand and modernise its rail network, partly as a mode of recovery to COVID-19 and partly in response to the climate crisis. The new master plan is called Deutschland Takt, partially modelled off the Swiss Taktfahrt plan, which is partly centred around regular interval services between major cities and more standardised timetables. For instance, Berlin to Hamburg every 30 minutes. Side note, I was actually really surprised to learn that Berlin to Hamburg trains weren't already every 30 minutes. For all the flack I give the UK, you know, we have a train between Manchester and London every 20 minutes, which if you think about it is remarkably frequent. But I digress. The German government is investing heavily in new rail infrastructure, including the under construction Stuttgart to Ulm High Speed Railway. Plans are being drawn up for a new underground through station in Frankfurt and Main, based off similar projects in Berlin and Stuttgart. This would expand capacity and remove the need for ICE and long distance trains to reverse at the station. To run more trains, Deutsche Bahn is massively expanding its fleet. Alongside the 220 ICE-4s already in delivery, the company has ordered 30 new ICE-3Ds. 
and could order up to 60 more. At the same time, the ICE-1 and ICE-2 fleets, which the ICE-4s were originally designed to replace, are now going to be retained in the medium term to expand capacity even further. Replacement of the intercity fleet with new double-deck coach sets, known as IC2, is ongoing, joined by 17 double-deck Stadler Kiss multiple units bought second-hand from Austrian open access operator Westfarn, confusingly also named IC2. Deutsche Bahn have ordered 23 push-pull sets from Talgo to operate between Berlin and Amsterdam, these are to be known as ECX. Danish operator DSB has ordered similar trains to operate between Copenhagen and Hamburg via the Great Belt Bridge. The Deutschland tax plan also includes modernising and electrifying various lines, reopening previously closed lines, and expanding regional fleets. There's been a lot of buzz recently about international sleeper and high-speed trains across Europe. So tell me this, what connects the Orient Express, the Austrian night jet network, the Trans-Europe Express, Greta Thunberg, and the EU? Find out in a new Train News bonus video coming soon. Have a very happy new year, thank you for watching and please subscribe.